Please turn in your Bibles to 1 Peter chapter 5. If you're using a pew Bible, that's page 1203. First Peter chapter 5, and we're going to begin our reading with verse 6. We'll read through to the end of the chapter. Hear the word of God and receive it with a believing heart. Humble yourselves, therefore, under God's mighty hand, that he may lift you up in due time. Cast all your anxiety on him because he cares for you. Be self-controlled and alert. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. Resist him, standing firm in the faith, because you know that your brothers throughout the world are undergoing the same kind of sufferings. And the God of all grace, who called you to his eternal glory in Christ, after you have suffered a little while, will himself restore you and make you strong, firm, and steadfast. To him be the power forever and ever. Amen. With the help of Silas, whom I regard as a faithful brother, I have written to you briefly, encouraging you and testifying that this is the true grace of God. Stand fast in it. She who is in Babylon, chosen together with you, sends, her greeting, sends you her greetings. And so does my son Mark. Greet one another with a kiss of love. Peace to all of you who are in Christ. Thus far, God's word. Uh, boys and girls, I want to uh, challenge you this evening, if you have a pen and a paper, to see if you can catch the three points of our sermon this evening. We're going to be talking about a spiritual battle plan. And what you need to know is that even though uh, you boys and girls are young, that you are in a spiritual battle. And that you need a spiritual battle plan just as much as the adults that are with us this evening. So grab a pen, grab a paper, and see if you can catch all three of our pointers for the spiritual battle plan tonight. I wonder how many of you have been to a military fort or to a historic battleground uh, of course, you can find uh, places like this all over our nation, and uh, given the way in which our nation's history has developed, uh, there's a much heavier concentration of them on the East Coast. And so I suspect that the vast majority of you present this evening have been uh, to at least one of these places. Uh, perhaps you've even had the privilege of watching uh, some kind of a, a, a reenactment, a revolutionary war reenactment or a civil war reenactment. Uh, but it's a kind of a disorienting experience because uh, as you walk around uh, a historic fort uh, or a battleground, you have uh, different signs and, and markers everywhere indicating uh, what life would have been like or uh, some of the significant events that took place, and yet uh, th th there's a, a kind of a mental disconnect, uh, a mental dissonance, if you will, because this is a leisurely activity very often. Maybe you even have brought a picnic with you and set up a picnic blanket, taken out a picnic basket on the battleground. But it's kind of strange if you think about it, isn't it? But you're sitting on ground where the blood of men and boys has been spilled. Where the atrocities of war have taken place. But I can't see it. And so it isn't real. Or I can't see it so it doesn't seem real. We are at war. That's what our text tells us this evening. We are at war. We are facing an enemy 
that will stop at nothing. And yet how many of us are sitting on our picnic blankets, cozied up with our picnic baskets, pretending that life goes on as normal? Take it as it comes. Well, in his closing exhortation, Peter reminds uh, his audience of what is going on in the unseen realm. Remember again the broader context of the letter. You have a group of believers that has been shaken, and they're shaken because they're experiencing suffering, and, and the suffering uh, isn't aligning with their expectation of the Christian faith. They thought that they signed up for something different, and now that they're experiencing suffering, they're beginning to wonder if, in fact, they've, they've lost the way. Uh, or if uh, maybe they haven't uh, believed the gospel correctly. But what Peter sees writing under the inspiration of the Spirit is that while these Christians are suffering in the flesh, there is a real danger that their enemy is gaining an advantage over them. You see, under the whole inspiration of the Holy Spirit, Peter leads us to understand that the spiritual danger that we face every single day is greater than the severity or the, the danger of the, our external circumstances and sufferings. And so he lays out before us what I'm calling this evening a spiritual battle plan. And he gives us uh, three strategies or three pointers for engaging in this spiritual warfare. And they may be a little bit different than what we expect. But I, I find them to be personally very helpful, uh, very moving, very challenging. And the first of these pointers, uh, the first of the strategies in the spiritual battle plan that Peter lays out before us this evening is that we must submit to the Almighty God. We must submit to the Almighty God, verses 6 and 7. Humble yourselves, therefore, under God's mighty hand, that he may lift you up in due time. Cast all your anxiety on him, because he cares for you. Now, there are three important truths that are laid out for us in the verses that we've just read. Uh, the first of these three truths is this. God exercises lordship over your suffering. God exercises lordship over your suffering. Look at what he says. Whose mighty hand is it that is responsible for your suffering? The implication is, it is the Lord himself. Humble yourselves, therefore, under God's mighty hand. Now, sometimes we're inclined to think that our suffering is either, A, simply uh, the, the product or, or, uh, or the invention of some malevolent force, and we're not going to downplay the malevolent evil that is behind suffering, um, we have the book of Job that lays that out before us as clear as the day that it is Satan that is behind the suffering that Job endures. And yet we have uh, the incredible, mind-boggling truth that Satan is answering to the Almighty God in bringing suffering into Job's life. And Peter says, Dear children of God, the same is true of you. If you are suffering... You are going to ask a number of questions. You may be cast into any number of doubts, but you must know this. You must keep this in mind that God exercises lordship over your suffering. That is to say, a trial and affliction cannot come into your life apart from the will of your Father who is in heaven. And we know that then, we trust then, that it is for our good. But second truth here is that your suffering is temporary. Your suffering is temporary. That he may lift you up in due time. What Peter is saying is that there is, in fact, an end 
to every Christian's suffering. We do not know when that end is. For some, uh, the suffering may endure for a shorter period of time than it does for others. We do know of Christians, uh, uh, heroes of the faith who have gone before, or uh, people uh, with whom we have personal acquaintance who it seems that their life is a string of sufferings, one after another. And so it seems that there is no end to suffering. But even should you endure suffering throughout the vast majority of your life, know this, there is an end to your suffering. And that your suffering, that the period of your suffering, the duration of your suffering pales in comparison to what God is preparing for you. I believe that's the implication that he's uh, making here, that he may lift you up. You see, it's not just that there's coming a cessation to your suffering, but that there's coming a time of, of lifting, um, a, a time of exaltation, a time of glory. And so then uh, he's saying much the same thing as uh, the Apostle Paul uh, spoke of in, I believe it's 2 Corinthians 4, where he talks about this light suffering, this, this temporary suffering is giving way to a, a far greater weight of glory. But your suffering is temporary. Third truth that he uh, reveals here to us in verse 7b, and this is a precious, precious word of comfort. Every child of God occupies the mind of God. You, dear child of God, are continually in the mind of God. Psalm 57 talks about the fact that uh, he gathers your tears in a bottle. Psalm 139 the psalmist expresses wonder at the innumerable thoughts that, that God has uh, toward his people. Likewise, Psalm 40, which we sung at the opening of our worship this morning, um, the psalmist says this, The things you have planned for us, no one can recount to you. Were I to speak and tell of them, they would be too many to declare. And this, by the way, was a confession of, uh, that came from experience because he said in the opening verses of the psalm, I waited patiently for the Lord. He lifted me out of the slimy pit. He set my feet on a rock and gave me a firm place to stand. You see what he was saying? He was saying that um, even though I might have been inclined to think when I was at the bottom of the pit, when I was sinking in miry clay, that the Lord has forgotten me, or the Lord doesn't care about me, or the Lord is removed from my suffering. That could not be further from the truth. Yes, I did have to wait, but I waited upon Him, and He delivered me. Dear child of God, you occupy the mind of God. The, the author of Hebrews says uh, this in Hebrews 7, verse 25, Therefore he, that is Jesus, is able to save completely those who come to God through him because he always lives to intercede for them. So what then is our, is our response to these truths? The God's lordship over our suffering, the temporary nature of our suffering, and the fact that God cares for his people. Well, the, the application is simply this. Verse 6, humble yourselves. Verse 7, cast all your anxiety on him. That is, you do not need to fight against your suffering but you can submit to God in your suffering because you know that He's in it and you know that He cares for you. And you can cast all your anxieties on Him because He cares for you. You can come to Him. You can cry out to Him. You can lay before Him in order all of the grievances that you are suffering. And you may be assured that He cares. Have you ever had fatigue from a person that you were relating your sorrows to? You saw that glazed over look? creeping in their eyes, not least of all in marriage. You have the sense, or maybe it's not a sense, maybe it's an outright statement. I've heard enough. Go cry in your bed. God never says that. 
He's never heard enough. He wants to hear your cares. He wants you to bring them to him. And there you will find comfort. But you see, there's a tendency that we have to sin in our suffering. Uh, There is a tendency on the one hand to resist the work of God in our suffering. To fight against it and, and to forget that it is God that is in our suffering. But then, uh, similarly, there is a temptation to anger, even bitterness, or uh, despair, uh, throwing up your hands and saying, I'm done, I give up, there's, there's no hope here. But Peter says, don't do that. Do not resist the hand, the loving hand of your Father in heaven. Know that He intends good to you. Know that He cares Do not give way to anger. Do not give in to despair. But submit yourself and lay your anxieties before God. Because God exercises sovereign power even over that which Satan intends for your hurt. Now some of you may be asking the question, well, does this mean that I may never seek relief from my suffering? No, it doesn't. There there may be lawful options for us to seek the alleviation of our suffering. But the key test here is a test of motive. Why are you seeking relief? And attitude. How do you respond if you do not find relief when you seek it? This exposes everything about the heart. But we are to submit to the Almighty God, knowing that God will not leave us in a sunken estate. So we submit to the Almighty God, but the second uh, pointer that he gives us for the spiritual battle plan is that we must recognize the spiritual battle in which we are engaged. And he shows us this in verses 8 and 9. Be self-controlled and alert. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. Resist him, standing firm in the faith, because you know that your brothers throughout the world are undergoing the same kind of sufferings. You see, he's confronting actually in a kind of a a subtle way, he's confronting the lie that so many of us believe. And the lie goes something like this. The greatest evil that I face in my life is my suffering. Or the greatest evil that I face in my life, in this life, is the lack of some material thing. Or the greatest evil that I face in this life is a lack of pleasure. He says, no, there's a much greater evil that confronts you day by day and you need to be aware of it. You need to understand that you are in the middle of a battle that you cannot see that you often do not perceive. In fact, you may be entirely oblivious to it. And um, I I think it will be helpful to explore this um, in a a step-by-step fashion, this recognizing the spiritual battle. So we're going to talk about what we need to know. We're going to talk about how we can prepare or how we must prepare and then how we fight. First of all, know this, you have a deadly enemy. Uh, He's called here in the passage before us, uh, your enemy, the devil, or uh, some translations uh, use the word, your adversary. And uh, the implication of this word is specifically an accuser. An adversary uh, brings us into the courtroom. Uh, An adversary is something akin to a prosecutor. And we know that that is one of the roles that Satan fulfills. For uh, he is called in Revelation 12, verse 10, the accuser of the brethren. And likewise, we have this vividly illustrated for us in Zechariah chapter 3, where we find him, uh, Satan the accuser, uh, we find Joshua the high priest clothed in dirty rags and, and Uh, All that's pouring out of the mouth of the accuser is how unworthy Joshua is and how uh, God has no right to show mercy to him and so on and so forth. Satan stood there at his right side to accuse him. 
You see, we have an adversary, or, or our enemy is an adversary, but he is also noted by the name devil. Now, I did a word search on devil, and it's very interesting, um, the, the things that are associated with the devil. I'm going to give you a short list, uh, and I'm going to uh, suggest that the spirit here using the term devil implies all of these and perhaps more. The devil, first of all, is a slanderer. He's a slanderer. Um, multiple passages refer to this fact. Uh, the, the word diabolos, which is translated devil, is actually also used um, in the, the epistles when uh, people are being commanded not to be uh, slanderous or when people are being called slanderers. So people can be diabolos. But he's also a thief. He's a thief. He has no respect of personal property. Least of all God's property. He's a thief. But he's also a liar. In fact, Jesus calls him what? The father of lies, right? But he's crafty too. Uh, you see, what he does, he relies on subterfuge. He, he relies on, on trickiness. Uh, uh, you know, you, you see how he approaches even the garden, for example, and he, he, he's got kind of like this side swipe uh, type of action going on. He's not a, he's not a full frontal collision uh, kind of, of enemy. But he's insinuating. He's crafty. He's tricky. And notice this. He's a murderer. Jesus says he was a murderer from the beginning. Now, I have a question for you. If there was a person in this room that you knew to be a slanderer, a thief, a liar, a cunning trickster, and a convicted murderer, how would you interact with that person? Would you let that person babysit your kids? I find it helpful to, to put that, the, the, the situation in those terms. On the authority of the Word of God, I tell you this evening, there is an enemy of that very nature in this room. Even now, he's working among some of you to steal the word that is being proclaimed. Others, he's yelling so loud about your guilt, perhaps, that you can't hear the word of God. And note this, he is deeply persistently, unrelentingly opposed to you. He hates you, and he desires nothing but your eternal misery. And he has a well-worn strategy, a strategy which Peter helpfully describes for us uh, in the text before us. He says, first of all, uh, that he prowls. Now, uh, how many of you have watched a, a documentary of lions hunting? I suspect that a, a number of us have, have seen video of lions hunting. Note this, lions don't hunt in the open, do they? They stalk, they creep, they watch, they pick their targets, and they're on it. And notice this, they prey on the weak. The stragglers, those who are becoming separate. What's the implication of this? First of all, ask yourself, am I in that category? Am I becoming separated from the body of Christ? Am I, am I really uh, engaging in the life of the body such that, that I'm uh, going to be safer from, from that prowler? But then secondly, and perhaps even more importantly, take a look around you uh, when we get out. Take a look around you on Sunday morning and look for people that are becoming separated. 
Look for those who are straggling. Look for those that you suspect to be weak because we are facing an enemy together and he's preying on the weak. He's picking them off one by one. We need to look out for the brethren because we have a prowling enemy. But he roars. His voice is terrifying. He's aggressive sounding. He's paralyzing. I I don't know about you, but I, I wonder... Uh, what my reaction would be if I came face to face with a 100% genuine article wild lion roaring. Would I run? I hope so. I don't know that that would do me much good. Or would I be paralyzed, frozen to the spot? You see, for those whom Satan, uh, is the, t- Satan takes some by prowling, he takes others by roaring, by terrifying, uh, perhaps uh, by his accusations, whatever it may be, keeping you from the work that God has you, keeping you from exercising the means which God has given you, keeping you uh, perhaps isolated from the body, because if they really knew the kind of person that I was, then they wouldn't want me with them. You fill in the blanks. But we have a roaring enemy, and we have a devouring enemy. Friends, Satan is not a cat or a dog that likes to catch a mouse or a chipmunk just to play with it. Have you ever seen an animal do that? I've seen that. They do it just for fun. It's not because they're hungry. But Satan has only one goal in mind, and that's devouring. He seeks nothing less than your eternal death in the misery of hell. That is what Satan wants for you. He wants you to be miserable with him. He wants you to turn your back on God. That's all. That's his strategy. So know your enemy. But secondly, prepare. Uh, Do not be taken unawares. He says uh, this, uh, verse 8, be self-controlled and alert. Um, uh, So this is actually the third time now that he's used this word that they keep translating um, self-controlled. But the, the, the... Self-control just just doesn't quite capture the the nuance. Uh, To be sober-minded might capture it um, a little bit better because what we're talking about specifically is to be in control of one's thoughts. Uh, To to actually be thinking. Um, Think about this. Uh, If if, uh, two armies are involved in war, there is a war room on each side. And in the war room are the best strategizers, the, the, the division commanders. They've got a map laid out before them. They're familiar with the terrain. They're understanding the various possibilities. And they're uh, identifying places of weakness. And they're identifying strategies uh, for the offensive. A bad commander is the commander who says, you know what, I feel like doing this today. A flim-flam, wishy-washy, ruled by one's emotions. But we are to be sober. We need to be in control of our thoughts. This is the opposite of irrationality. This is the opposite of emotionally controlled thinking. This is precisely what Paul's describing in Romans 12, verse 2, being transformed by the renewing of our minds, which we do through... uh, um, Meaningful time spent in the word of God and through time spent in prayer. But we are to also be vigilant. That is, watch. Uh, the, 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 the deadly part about the whole situation is that we have a traitor that lives within our breast. This is the, the, the most, uh, maybe one of the most sobering things about the passage here. Is because as we do warfare with Satan, it's not as if Satan and his schemes and his temptations are um, a stranger to us, as, they are, as if they are some kind of, of foreign entity to us. But he comes to us in cunning craftiness. He comes to us because you see, he has a war room. He has a strategy map. And guess what? He's been studying you. Now, Satan isn't God. There's a great deal that Satan doesn't know, but Satan does observe and he does learn. Where are you going? Where are your eyes going? What are you speaking? What are your weaknesses 
that you think are hidden from view, but perhaps Satan is observing. And developing a plan tailored for you. We need to be vigilant. We need to keep a watch on our own hearts. We need to be watching what's going on around us. We need to be keeping an eye on our Christian uh, brothers and sisters, uh, caring for one another. This is how we prepare. So we know our enemy, we prepare, and then we fight. We fight. And the fight happens here. Verse 9, resist him standing firm in the faith because you know that your brothers are undergoing the same kinds of sufferings. Note, first of all, that this fight is not a passive action, but this is an offensive term. Uh, it, it means that we're, we're taking uh, action. Satan's greatest weapon, the great advantage that he has over you and the great advantage that he has over me is our ignorance, uh, our willful ignorance, those things that we willfully choose to ignore about ourselves, about our circumstances, about our situation. And what, Paul, or what Peter is describing here is the offensive action of faith. He's saying, plant your feet on the promises of God. Plant those, your feet on those promises which have been confirmed in Christ. I don't know about you, I've seen this uh, thing on Facebook before, this stupid thing. It's so stupid. It's, it's, you've got to call stupid things just stupid. I know. It's not a nice word. But this thing, it's one of these e-card things, you know, and, and it talks about something like, Satan says, I'm going to bring a storm on you that's going to wipe you out. And, and, you know, in the end, you say, I am the storm. Eh, wrong. No, you're just weak. You're not the storm. The only power that you have is a derived power. It's a power derived through faith in Jesus, through faith in his word, through faith in his promises. It is in him that you will have victory. You must not expect victory if you're, uh, if you're <clears throat> fighting on any other ground or from any other uh, kind of weaponry. But he says, uh, as you fight, know this, that this is the common experience of Christians in every age, in every location. Now, that's, uh, you could take that in a way that says misery loves company. Um, and so it's like, well, you're miserable in this fight. Well, you know, take heart because everybody else in the church is miserable too. But that's not the point. That's not the point he's making. The point that he's making is that this is part and parcel of the Christian faith. It is to fight the, the warfare of faith. And the warfare of faith, though the, the very uh, most basic details on the externals may differ from place to place and person to person, the fight is the same. And it's a fight that every child of God is involved in. Now, it occurs to me that there's a sinful tendency to invert the commandments given in verse 6 and verse 9. Verse 6, the command is what? Submit or humble. Um, verse 9, the command is resist. But too often, we're resisting the hand of God in our afflictions. We're fighting against it and we're saying, I don't want that. And meanwhile, we're laying down content to submit to Satan, to his temptations, and to what he would have us to do. We need to get our heads straight, folks. We need to get our hearts straight. So, submit to Almighty God. Recognize the spiritual battle for what it is. And thirdly, finally, contend with victory in sight. Verse 10 and following. A few things that we want to draw out of here. <clears throat> Notice uh, how he refers to God. He's the God of what? Of all grace. What he's saying here is, do you have a need as you face the spiritual warfare tonight? Is there something that you are lacking? Go to the God of all grace. He provides for us the weapons of our warfare. He provides for us the armor, Ephesians chapter 6. He is the God of all grace. He's generous. He has what we need. 
The only thing that keeps us from having it is, from, uh, is asking. The fact that we don't ask. But he says, and moreover, it's, it's the, this God of all grace is the same one who has called you to his eternal glory in Christ. You see, we are destined. This is our destiny. Uh, later this week, young people, uh, the topic, one of our topics for uh, our final workshop is going to be destiny. That's part of our identity in Christ is our destiny. And what is our destiny? Our destiny is as sons and daughters of God. It is as princes and princesses in the kingdom of God. It is to rule with God. It is to be kings and priests before the Lord our God. That is our destiny. That is what God has reserved for his people. Oh yes, Christians seem like inglorious and weak people in the here and now. And the fact of the matter is, that's straight up facts. That is who we are. But. The Lord has a glorious plan for every person who believes in the Lord Jesus Christ. It is glory in Christ. Paul lays it out, this golden chain of salvation in Romans 8, um, moving all the way from calling to glory. You see, the, the point is that God does not call. He does not effectually call the one whom he does not also provide every single thing that he or she needs in order to reach glory. That is, when we are called, we are set on a track, and that track leads only one direction, and it ends in only one place, and that is nothing less than heaven. If you're called, you're on the train, and you're headed to glory. Take heart. Thirdly, the suffering, again, he says, is short. It's short in light of eternity after you have suffered a little while. Time is passing. Time is passing much more quickly than you think it is. And before you know it, you will be standing in the presence of your Savior. If that strikes terror into your heart, that may expose a spiritual problem tonight. Are you ready? Are you ready to stand before Jesus? Are you ready to meet him? If you're not, you better get there. He's reminding you tonight. His life is passing. It will soon be gone. Before you know it, you'll wake up before the face of God in heaven. Fourth, our salvation depends upon the power of God. To him be the power forever and ever. This is the glorious thing. God hasn't left you to fight on your own. He hasn't left you to summon up enough power, enough strength to prevail in this battle. The power is his forever and ever. He doesn't want what power you can contribute. He doesn't, he doesn't want what you're bringing to the table. What he wants is given to you in Jesus, his son. And that's that. Well, we are to contend with victory in sight. You know, those who are fighting in an earthly battle, the future is always in the balances. They don't know what the outcome of the battle is going to be. One day it may favor uh, Army A, one day it may favor Army B. You just don't know what's going to happen in a battle. But the remarkable thing is we know exactly how this battle ends. And it ends with the ultimate victory of Jesus and the triumph of all those who have believed and trusted in him. This is, these are words of encouragement and assurance. That you're suffering. Look at this. He says, I have written to you briefly encouraging you and testifying that this is the true grace of God. No, you didn't take a wrong turn. No, your suffering is not evidence that God doesn't love you or that God has abandoned you or that you haven't really believed or that you haven't really experienced salvation. Your suffering is entirely to be expected, child of God. This is the true grace of God. Now plant your feet and stand in it. Don't be afraid. But you're not alone. He says, Silas, your faithful brother, um, he, he has been writing with me 
she who is in Babylon, that is the church in Rome, I take it, uh, of which uh, Peter is the minister, we believe, um, chosen together with you, sends her greetings. So does my son Mark. You may look at your neighbors. You may be rejected by your neighbors. The world may think that you're a fool, but you belong to a family that is spread around this globe. A family whose bond is the love of God in Christ Jesus. You're not alone. And he leaves us then with this word. Peace to all of you who are in Christ. Peace. Peace now. Peace forevermore. Peace in Christ. Well, are you aware of the battle within you, around you? Do you know your enemy? Beware of ignorance. Let us then be sober, vigilant, that we may resist our enemy steadfast in faith, Let us keep our eyes upon our great captain who has called us to ultimate victory and eternal glory. To to God be the glory and dominion forever and ever. Peace to all of you who are in Christ. Amen. Father in heaven, we thank you for your the great salvation that you have accomplished through your Son, Jesus Christ. We thank you, Lord, for everyone here who has been brought to be a partaker of Christ and who then uh, legitimately receives the comforts and the consolations of this text while recognizing the challenges. We confess, O Lord, that we are often ignorant, that we are uh, often insensible and spiritually stupid, that uh, we are too often intoxicated with the world, with the the way of the world, uh, with uh, the general pattern of life in the world, with the pleasures of the world. Give us eyes for eternity. Give us eyes for the return of Jesus from heaven. Give us eyes for a new heavens and a new earth. We pray for those, O Lord, who are yet outside of you, uh, those who are at the mercy of Satan without any of the protections of Christ, we pray, Lord, that you may call them, that you may draw them, that you may bring them to humble themselves under your almighty hand, that they may humble themselves before Christ, that they too uh, may partake then of all the blessings and benefits of which we've just been reminded. To you be the glory forever and ever. Amen.